organizers last year got like the CEO of JP Morgan and the police commissioner and this year they got a massive goofball in me. However, now that I'm here, I'm going to tell you about the world's most interesting educational story. Cool? Before I start, I want to play a game. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a bunch of seemingly random Indian celebrities and I want you to tell me what all of them have in common. Can we do this? Ma'am, can we? Super, let's do it. This uh, young and I must admit extremely charming Bollywood actress, this veteran politician, this acclaimed economist and this emerging young cricketer. Anyone? Oh, lovely. He's right. They're all engineers by education. Cool, right? In fact, let me share with you some fascinating insight. Ever since our independence in 1947, we produce zero Nobel laureates in science. The US has 100 plus. 26 Olympic medals. That's it. Just 26 Olympic medals. And China produced 100 in the 2008 games alone. However, however, there is something we produce more than the US and China combined. Anyone's guess, right? Number of engineers. Now, who am I and why and how do I know so much? Look, he's laughing. <laughs> he's, he's an engineer himself. So, <laughs> who am I and why and how do I know so much about this story? So, so I spent my initial years of growing in Saudi Arabia, right? And then my parents packed me back to Bombay in lieu of better education. And in school, I made two big mistakes. Do you want to know what those mistakes are? Yeah? Okay. So the first mistake of my life was that I was good at studies. Okay. The second mistake of my life was I was particularly good at math. <laughs> now in India, when you commit these two mistakes, you end up committing a third mistake by default, which is you get into engineering, <laughs> which is exactly what I did. Now, um, in engineering life, I, I, I kind of realized early on it wasn't quite my thing, right? So I founded this t-shirt startup. In case you can't recognize me, that's, that's me without all the beard. <laughs> So I founded this t-shirt startup to vent my frustration, and uh, for which I was listed as one of India's top student entrepreneurs. Later on, I moved to the city of Bangalore, where I spent a solid two years essentially selling chai. Now, here's the thing about Bangalore, all right? Bangalore is full of engineers, okay? And they are not just engineers. They are engineers frustrated with their lives. No, it's not funny. So one in every 20 IT employees uh, in Bangalore, contemplate suicide at some point of his life. It's crazy, right? Now, uh, what happened next is I quit my job because I was curious, like, how did such a diverse country like us get so obsessed with one thing, producing engineers, and look like nobody before me tried answering? So I quit my job, and then something magical happened. Some 300 people across the globe contributed 14,000 Australian dollars in a record setting crowdfunding campaign to help me, the goofball, compile a book. Okay? So over the next two years, I found out about a lot of interesting people, places, and events that helped shape what I call one of India's greatest obsessions. Now, it's going to be difficult for me to take you through like two years of research in a couple of minutes, right? So what I'm going to do is going to take you through some of these people, some of these places, and some of these events. Okay, are you ready? Can we start? Okay. So the first person I'm going to tell you about is this very, very interesting character who goes by the name Thomas Babington Macaulay. Now, Macaulay was a born genius. He had an estimated IQ of like, what, 180 to 190. He had the tremendous ability to learn any language within a fortnight. Okay, so the Brits told him, dude, like, you know, India is one of our newer colonies and one of our more important colonies. Why don't you go there and, you know, help figure a few things for us? So he said, India, there is no way I'm going to India. So then the Brits said, dude, can you please do this for us? So Macaulay didn't have a lot of friends, okay? And he was dearly attached to his sisters. So he pleaded with a certain Hannah, saying that, Hannah, these guys want me to go to India. Can you please come? I don't want to go alone. So Hannah said, and I quote, I see India only as a country of filth and disease. So this is what the Brits did next. They said, okay, fine. We'll give you 10,000 pounds, which in today's time translates to half a million pounds. Now face it, if somebody gave me half a billion pound right now, I'd be willing to go to North Korea. <laughs> right? so, uh, so this guy, uh, 
forcibly got his sister to India, and he roughly spent four years in India, did not bother learning a single Indian language, went back to the Britain Parliament, okay, and on 2nd of February 1835, made a very momentous speech, which I'm not going to quote entirely, but I'm just going to pick up one line, which kind of summarizes the spirit of the entire speech. Macaulay said, and I quote, we need to teach Indians English. If we do not teach them English, they are going to waste their youth touching a cow's ass. This is what he said. And tada, that's how English education came to India. Now, what does English education have to do with the life of India's engineers? Right? Couple of things. One, a vast majority of India's engineers are actually unemployable. Do you know why? Anyone from the industry, they probably know why, what, what's lacking the most. Anyone? Lovely. Yeah, close enough. Poor so they don't call it that. They call it poor communication skills. Right? Poor communication skills is innuendo for, you know, poor English. And come on, English isn't a natural language, right? It's an acquired language. So English became a class in India. It didn't just become a language. Secondly, this very important IT revolution to which so many of us Indian engineers owe our lives to, and also our first foreign trip to, happened in India and not in China. You know why? Because of our familiarity with English. Just because we were acquainted with English, could be, you know, able to code easily and also talk to our clients in Europe and America. Cool, right? Now, now that I mentioned America, let's discuss the Indian engineers' tremendous success story in the US tech industry. So beat this, right? Two of the biggest tech giants in the world are today run by Indian engineers. And you know, they actually owe their lives to a very specific moment in history. That moment is actually as specific as this. 4th of October, 1957, 7.28 PM. OK, so what happened on 4th of October, 1957, 7.28 PM is, the Soviets launched the first human satellite in space, the Sputnik, and the US lost, it, lost its mind. You know, so the US and Russia always have had this Indian student type, uh, have been like two Indian students, right? Always want to do better than each other. So. <laughs> So the Americans uh, lost their mind and they said, dude, we need to do something, man. So they changed their entire immigration policy. And they invited the best of scientists, the best of doctors, and the best of engineers from across the globe. Now, engineers back in India were pretty brainy, are rather still pretty brainy, I'd say. And they were frustrated with, with India's socialist regime back then, because it didn't allow them to do much. The government controlled practically everything. So they had two options. Okay, one was to go with our best friend forever, BFF, as they say these days. BFF Russia, or to go to America, with whom we didn't have the best of relations, at least back then. But what happened was something curious. Most engineers ditched their best friends Russia, and all went to, most of them went to America instead. Can anyone tell me why? Anyone? No? Macaulay, English. Because we were comfortable speaking in English like the Americans did, all of them moved to America, and the rest is history, right? The earliest bunch of engineers who went to America did extremely well, not just for themselves, but also for America, and then paved the way for future engineers to come from India. So much so that kids these days actually take up engineering so that they can go to the US. That's the easiest ticket to the US, right? In fact, you won't believe this, and I'm not exaggerating, okay? There are communities in South India, there are communities in South India that educate their sons in engineering, send them to the US just so that they can command high dowry. Because US return has a lot of command, supposedly in their community, a lot of dowry. Right? Now, moving from the US, coming back to India and to my favorite three letter word, the IITs. Now, See, now if you're Indian, I'm not going to bother uh, you know, introducing the IITs to you. But what I'm going to tell you instead is how Ameri uh, an American news broadcaster once introduced the IITs to its uh, uh, you know, viewers in America. And listen to it carefully, OK? Listen to it carefully. It said, and I'm quoting, we import oil from Saudi Arabia, cars from Japan, television from Korea, and whiskey from Scotland. So what do we import from India? We import people, some really, really smart people. And all these people seem to share a common credential. 
they are all graduates of the Indian Institute of Technology, or the IITs as they are known. Now, when US compares something to oil, you know it has to be valuable. <laughs> right? And in fact, it's not just valuable to them, valuable to our society to the extent that once this affluent woman in Delhi, accompanied by her equally affluent father, took her son to the then director of IIT Delhi, okay? and uh, requesting for an admission, of course. So now the father got slightly embarrassed. So he left the room. The father left the room, and, and then the director saw this kid's uh, report card, and he said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't get your kid into the IITs. However, I can get him into the Imperial College of London, which he eventually did. Now, you know what's fascinating about the story? The characters involved. Does anyone want to take a guess as to who the characters are? I'll tell you. Indira Gandhi, Pandit Nehru, and Rajiv Gandhi. The most powerful family in the country can be denied admission into the IITs. Now, where I'm coming from is uh, what happened gradually that, you know, in a society that reeks of corruption in everyday life, the IITs became one of those very few meritorious institutions for the Indian middle class, you know, for their social upliftment. That is one. Second, what also happened is for the longest time, the IITs were essentially, IITs or other engineering colleges were essentially the only institutes which offered quality education of any kind, right? So eventually, you know, the Indian middle class decided to put their kids into the IITs or take up other engineering courses. Now, uh, if something Bollywood has taught me, okay, is that every great obsession has an equally fascinating chase, be it women or be it engineering. So my journey took me to a lot of these places, of which I'm going to tell you about two, two very interesting places. The first one is the city of Hyderabad. So these images that you see are from one of the student hostels I managed to get rare access to. I'll tell you why rare, because these kids are disconnected, absolutely disconnected from the outside world. I'm not kidding, if the aliens were to invade us right now, they would be the last people to know. Guys and uh, girls aren't allowed to talk to each other. They're suspended if they're caught talking. Right? The sole purpose of their life is to study and get through a good engineering college. In fact, you won't believe this. And it's, you know, the funniest part is whatever I'm saying may sound funny, and that's the funniest part. This guy left all his belongings and ran for his life out of the campus. Nobody knows where he went, nobody knows what he did. He just ran out of this madness. Seriously. Now from uh, uh, Hyderabad, let's go up north to this interesting city called Kanpur. Okay? Now in Kanpur, there is this small locality that's called Coaching Mandi. Because there are so many coaching classes there. So the locals call it Coaching Mandi. Okay? So then I got talking to a local Panwala and I said, uh, you know, can you tell me the origins of this place and history and how did it start? So he told me there was this old professor who started coaching kids into engineering colleges and gradually everyone followed and it became like a big business. I'm like, cool. So tell him, can, where can I, you know, see the old man? He said, and I quote, Sir, wo to upar hi milenge, unka murder ho chuka hai. <laughs> and, and for these UP guys, mur a murder ho chuka hai. It's like one of those things, right, that, that keep happening. In fact, not just that, uh, it, it, so this place is actually, uh, you know, a hot pot for gang wars between coaching professors who shoot each other dead out of rivalry, right? Just kidnap and shoot them dead. But this isn't really the sort of death that worries me the most. Let me tell you what does. Now this young girl could, you know, like most teenagers, have had her share of man crushes, listen to her whatever music, could have been part of this audience today or seen this video later on YouTube. But the sad part is, she's no more, right? And she's no more only because she didn't want to become an engineer. And she isn't really alone. India has one of the highest youth suicide rates in the world. 20 kids kill themselves every day, mostly due to academic pressure. In fact, God knows by the time my talk is over, some kid somewhere must try, you know, killing himself or killing herself. Crazy society we live in, right? Anyway, let's get out of this gloom, and uh, I'll show you one of my more relatable illustrations from the book. 
So here you see a young boy called Mohan Zakarwal, who back in 2003 goes to his parents and tells them, tell them that mom, dad, you have this fantastic idea. I want to create something called as a social network, and I think it's going to change the world. Obviously, Indian parents think that he's possessed probably by a ghost, get a havan done, get him into an engineering college. And today, Mohan Zakarwal is probably a mid-level IT manager contemplating suicide in Bangalore. But you know, every story has a villain, no? Every story has a villain. So I was trying to find out the biggest villain of my story. And I searched for really long. And guess where I found it? Right behind me with a cute and innocent little face. You know what that is? Our schools. Now, Indian schools, no matter how you look at it, is easily the biggest human resource tragedy in the world, I can assure you. But the biggest tragedy actually lies in its design. Right? Now, if you look at it, how did our schools come into being? No? Our schools are actually more than 400 years old. So the empire, 400 years uh, ago, basically needed three kinds of people. Right? They needed clerks to manage their territories, military guys to protect their territories, and they needed factory workers because the Industrial Revolution had just started. And what are the kind of skill set that these factory workers or these three kind of people require? No creativity. These are required skill set, no creativity. Listen to instructions, right? So it is actually no coincidence that our schools are modeled on a factory, uh, like exactly how a factory is modeled, right? Right from, if I can give you an analogy, right from the ting ting of the bell right, in the factories to say, symbolize that, you know, it's lunch, you all can go get out of the factory and go and eat your food. To the grouping of kids, it's based on the age and not the learning ability. Test and the point of a test is not to assess a kid's strength and weakness, but to actually certify him as okay or fail, just like in factories. Now, it's clear, if, if we don't really fix our schools, India has the largest student base in the world. And if we don't fix our schools, all these kids are going to look the same. Boring, dull, and uninspiring, right? Now, unless we fix our schools, in India, you will always become an engineer first and then decide what to do with your life. And with all the chaos, tragedy, death, blood, the life of India's engineers will continue to remain the world's most interesting educational story. Thank you so much.